Welcome back to the Beyond the Wealth podcast. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez, and today I have Paul Alex. Paul Alex is the owner of ATM Together, Merchant Automation, the Level Up podcast, which he was nice enough to let us use his studio today. Brother, thank you so much for coming on the show. Of course, brother. Anytime, man. Anytime. Yes, You're sir. a good dude. Now, welcome to Miami. I know you've been here, I think, almost a year now or yeah. close to that time. Like the people watching the show know, I'm a Miami native, so I always like to welcome my new Miami entrepreneurs into this jungle that yep. you just got into. Uh, let's just start with how has Miami treated you to start? Dude, my, Miami has been a wild ride. <laughs> I mean, uh, like, like we were talking about before the pod, dude, like the whole uh, housing situation, yeah. uh, everything, the rise of like inflation with uh, just real estate, uh, living costs. I mean, it's just insane. Insane. Like, you know, I, leave, uh, I live in deep South Florida, yep. and I just can't believe that, like, right down the street, I'm having a Lamborghini dealership being built, which is, to me, it was weird. I was just like, dude, they're building a Chick-fil-A and then Lamborghini dealership. <laughs> so you're just seeing everything blow up now. But um, interesting story, dude. Like, you know, when I first moved to Miami, I, uh, I had told you, like, I was going to live more closer to downtown Miami, and uh, I had put a deposit of, like, 700 k on a house. Um, dude in contract for like 90 days. I was already packing all my all my things from my penthouse in San Diego. And I was on the way over here when, you know, my real estate agent was like, hey, Paul, like, they're backing out. And it was literally like two weeks before we actually like closed the deal. And I'm oh, like, God. how is this possible? Well, I guess what's happening a lot in the real estate game is that you get a lot of people from overseas just paying straight up cash, dude. Yep. That, that house that initially I was gonna buy was like $2 million. I put $700,000 down. And it's just because with me, cash flow is everything, dude. So mm -hmm. I want to keep some money in the bank just in case, like, there's yep. an opportunity, right? Yep. Like, you were like, hey, Paul, dude, like, let's start investing into this other business. And then I'm like, hell yeah, I got the cash, right? Yep. So, you know, I, I put about 700K down, dude. And the what they knew was sort of shady is they had their lawyer send um, a letter to my real estate agent saying, like, hey, you got two options. Number one, you could go ahead and try to fight this in court. We're going to, like, hold the money in escrow, $700,000, and it'll probably last about a year or two years. So if you're willing to go through that, go ahead. Or number two, here's a contract that you could get your money back within two days and be about your way. We're not going to cover any additional expenses. I had to pay an additional $10,000, dude, to stay in an Airbnb for about the first month, oh um, which sort of sucked. And I know you had a similar situation, right? Yeah. I mean, this is so Miami. It's hilarious. <laughs> like... Same thing with me. Went, bought a house, went under contract. I'm 25. I just put 80 grand into a house. I'm thinking, holy shit. And then right before we're supposed to send the next wire for the second escrow check, uh, they basically were like, hey, we're not moving forward. You have one option. You already missed your date. We lied to you about telling you we were going to sign the amendment. You have uh, 30, you have uh, 24 hours to basically sign this new contract, get your money back, or fight us in court for one to two years. I'm 25. I just, I just YOLO'd all my money into this new house, and I'm like, fuck this, we're out. I, I backed out. I'm like, I can't do this. It's too stressful. Um, but, yeah, that's, it's just it's Miami shit. Like, yeah. everything's weird. There's always shit going on. I went under contract on a few other houses, and it was like, oh, yeah, sorry. This guy from Guatemala just came in and paid 300000 over and just wired all cash. And it's like, how is the young? It's like, and I'm not looking at small houses it's not like i'm struggling to buy a little one bedroom condo i'm trying to buy a nice house at 25 i'm excited can't do it physically could not do it and i think that just speaks for the growth of miami and where it's kind of headed um which for new people moving in and business people great really exciting for locals i don't think it's all that exciting and people are moving a little bit to the suburbs but that's just what happens when a city's booming and i think miami is the hottest place in the world right now and i think people are starting to realize that yeah, dude, I, uh, I read an article actually this past week that Miami's number two uh, and number one right now is actually Texas. Oh, okay. Texas is like booming right now just because the amount of real estate and then also mm -hmm. the cost of living, dude. It's, yeah. it's a lot cheaper than Miami, yep. but I can see why. But you, you got a lot of Californians, New York yep. uh, going out there. And, you know, typically the average person that is going and moving to Texas and Miami right now is anyone making roughly over one hundred twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars? So just imagine that. Like, yeah. what do you think is going to happen to all the locals? Yeah, no, they're going to be forced to move. Like, you have areas in Miami, like Hialeah, where that's been a safe haven for Cubans coming into Miami. Yeah, a house in Hialeah is seven hundred fifty grand now. Yeah, like, that's that insane. person coming from Cuba is not buying that house like they used to when six years ago it was two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I, I, I'm curious to see how Miami starts to shape out what new quote unquote suburbs start to get more populated. Um, but from an overall business perspective and 
if you own real estate or own any assets in the city, you've got to be pumped with what's happening. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. I mean, even just me buying my uh, my residence, you know, uh, about 11 months ago now, dude, it's it's already up uh, <laughs> about $300,000. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous, it's ridiculous. Dude. Yeah, the ROI right now on uh, housing, the housing market in Miami is just insane. Well, it's just crazy, like... <laughs> In my neighborhood specifically, we've lived there forever. It's become a very affluent neighborhood on the water. And you'll just, we've seen over the last five years, it's like the blocks there. There's plenty there. Most of the people in the neighborhood have lived there 30, 40 years. And it'll just be like, oh, that house just went for sale. And they're asking 1.8. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, it's sold. And next year, damn, that house is up for sale. 2.5. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. Oh, it's sold. Oh, look, that house on the corner is up for sale. 3.8. That's out of control. Oh, it's sold. Yeah. It's like, okay, when does it stop? Like, how much more? And we just keep getting a lot of these foreign and people from other countries that want to be here and want to be in this area who are very wealthy back home that just don't care. They're yeah. like, and, and we get the New Yorkers and people from Chicago. You tell somebody from New York that they could get a four bedroom, two story house on the water for $3 million. Yeah. And they're paying $3 million for a 1,800 square foot. Uh, apartment, they're like, oh, that's a deal. Yeah. But the locals are like, dude, that's fucking expensive. Yeah. So I think we're getting a little bit of like that. All these people who are used to it and are fine paying that, moving in and just saying, well, they want to negotiate. I don't mind. That's a fair price in my opinion. Here you go. And it's tough for some of the people that want to move around and live here um, that aren't absolutely crushing it. Yeah. No. Absolutely, man. I mean, that that was the the primary reason why I even moved from Cali to to Miami, dude. Is just like. You know, I left law enforcement. Law enforcement at my peak, bro. I was mm -hmm. making like two hundred fifty thousand dollars, but I was working like eighty to one hundred hour work weeks. Okay, so, so you're like, earning that two fifty. Yeah. I was literally killing myself, bro. Yeah. And that was from like twenty six to about thirty one. And out of the seven years that I was in law enforcement, those five years, dude, I was consistently working six days out of the seven days out of the week, and eighty to one hundred hours. I was literally sleeping in my car in between shifts like probably like two to three hours just for power naps, dude. And then literally like how I'll have like meal prep. Like I just have my day set, but I had like no personal life. I was losing time with my family. Um, it wasn't until like I started investing into like these simple businesses that yep. we were talking about and then started making a little bit of residual income that made me financially free. And then I was able to focus on digital marketing, dude, because that's just where the world's going, dude. This is how yep. we met, right? Yep. It's just 100%. like we met online and this is how I met a lot, actually quite a few of my employees. Um, I met them online, dude. I would interview them on Zoom. Uh, some of them would come and actually work out of the office. Some of them won't. But, dude, it's it's a crazy world now. You know, I'm I'm you're 25. <laughs> I'm about to be 37 in January, dude. And it's just like if you're not riding the wave of like the digital space, yep. you're getting left behind. 100. percent I actually just wrote a newsletter. I think like two or three weeks ago. Yeah. Saying that the digital resume, quote unquote, your social medias, any presence you have online will be uber valuable in the next 10 years. And people think that it's peak, people think that they're late, but in my opinion, they're like really early oh, yeah. and that we don't even know what it's gonna be like. And I think 10 years from now, people will get jobs because of their social media following and what they've built on social media. And like some people will lose out on jobs because they have no footprint online and they thought it wasn't necessary. Um, so, cause I, I just think like the ability to interconnect and meet people. And I know one of your favorite quotes is your net worth is your network. It is so true. Yeah. And social media gives you almost a free pass into like meeting all of these people and you are light years ahead of the person that doesn't take it serious or uses social media for just pleasure, not business. No, it's so true, man. And that's an interesting take that you say on that because dude, I've gotten special, I guess you could say treatment from like let me give you a great example i got married about two months ago in vegas right okay and we did like a very old school like elvis presley style mm -hmm. vegas uh wedding and that was like our our dream so we were able to get our reception done at a restaurant um i don't recall the actual name we were just there this past week i was just in vegas two um, weeks ago too oh really yeah nice but uh this restaurant it books out for like two to three months dude that, that that's how long this steakhouse um, oh, it's called Golden Steer. Yep. yep. Okay, Golden uh -huh. Steer, right? And all the celebrities go there every time they're in Vegas. Great steakhouse. You get like a pound of lobster, dude. It's amazing, <laughs> right? Um, but anyways, they don't do weddings inside of this reception. But I thought it'd be badass. I was just like, I was telling my wife now. I was like, babe, you know, make it happen. And you know what she did? 
all she did was screenshot my profile with the amount of followers I have. And to be honest, dude, I have a decent amount of followers. I don't think I'm the most known person. I, I, I do whatever decent organic yeah. traffic to my page, but I have around 470,000 uh, followers, right? And the Golden Steer, the management at Golden Steer made an exception to have my wedding at that restaurant because of my following. Wow. And we got like the best photographers, the best video team coming from Miami there. Dude, my wife's dress costs like $17,000. My tux costs like about $3,000. Dude, the wedding itself costs about 60 Gs. And I don't say this to like say, oh yeah, I'm spent this much money because I know people that spent like hundreds of thousands of yeah. dollars on the wedding. It's Miami, dude. Come on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> You're yeah. never going to be the richest person yeah. here. But I say that because we wanted to make it very special, yep. right? And now they host weddings because of our wedding. That's they hilarious. use our wedding video. They gotta to, kick. They gotta kick you guys back some money, right? They dude, just got a we, new revenue stream, bro. We get <laughs> VIP access every time we want to go. Oh, but we okay, don't that's, have. To, that's fair. That, that's dude, fair. That's badass. Because you know how many times I go to Vegas for business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. we were just there. Like our first night, we went there. VIP access. We got the like Elvis booth in the back, dude. dude it, was, it was amazing. That's awesome. And I recommend if you guys are ever in Vegas, go to Golden Steer. They're a phenomenal steakhouse. Yeah. Dude, that's amazing. Yeah. Before we dive into the boring businesses and quote unquote boring business, because that's like the trendy thing to say <laughs> yeah. now, yeah. basically businesses that make you a shitload of money without that much work is the nicer way to say it. Yeah. I have to ask about the law enforcement part of your career. Yeah. What is an awesome story you can share about that? Because oh, for people that don't know and haven't watched your content, you were like 21 Jump Street, like detective undercover unit. Yeah. There's got to be an awesome story that you've got in the bank. The, the number one story I always love to tell friends family even my parents my stepdad when I first joined he was just like tell me tell me like every single time I go eat dinner with them yeah. is my very first day on the task force so before I went on this narcotics task force he um I was actually in law enforcement excuse me I was actually in law enforcement for about two and a half years before I got on the task force Be prior to that I was on I was a beat cop in uh east Oakland in California which is one of the roughest neighborhoods gang infested dude they had like probably anywhere between like two to three murders a day, but they had like over 21 shootings a week. Um, it was insane, dude. It was like Iraq, <laughs> yeah. right? So yeah. when you think about it like that, um, I had a lot of experience in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And with me, I'm able to handle a lot of stress. Like I live in control chaos. Yep. I guess this is why I was perfect fit for entrepreneurship. Yep. So um, within uh, that short amount of time, I was voluntold by one of the captains of police. Hey, you're going to go to gang unit. So I went to gang unit for about a year. And then what I found out is, you know, I, I'm also, uh, I'm Hispanic, so I'm mm -hmm. proving a Mexican, right? right. Um, and I was able to speak Spanish to a lot of people that, you know, were dealing narcotics on the street. And I was just like, hey, what's going on? You know, who are these dealers? And they would just, you know, I would befriend them. Yeah. And uh, like we were talking about communication skills and all that. So they would start telling me information on these bigger guys. And um, I turned them into informants. And that was my thing, dude. I was like the the investigator that would basically be the communicator for my squad so i then i took that asset uh because it is an asset guys like your skills is absolutely everything your skills especially communication yep. can make you a multi-millionaire and uh i got put on a special task force where out of eight, 800 uh officers i went to basically 21 jump street in real life <laughs> and i worked under the sheriffs the alameda county sheriff's department and they were like no joke bro like they were on netflix they had multiple uh, shows like drugs inc uh this show called dope uh, which i was uh, in but i was wearing like a mask so yeah. you can't see me yeah. because like I don't think that's smart to put my face out there, especially no, when I'm not going after cartel yeah, members yeah, yeah. Um, and, and all that stuff during that time. And um, yeah, so I got to experience what most cops think police work is, mm -hmm. like getting on a plane, doing surveillance from a plane, uh, going to undercover, sh like switching cars like day and night. Dude, I was driving like the Chargers, like you, well, you would see in the movies with like the lights yeah. and all I like at the movie and to watch. Um, but ultimately, the, the story that comes to mind is my very first day. Um, I was about 27 going to 28 years old. So I was uh, around your age. Yeah. And I remember I was I was scared out of my mind, dude. <laughs> I was scared out of my mind because uh, it was my very first day. I show up and they're getting ready for this operation. And there was over like 100 police officers, federal agents, like we're talking about from FBI, DEA, HSI, um, even Postal Service, dude. And I, I never knew that Postal Service has like their own law enforcement portion. Say, Postal Service. Well, because the thing is like, 
like with federal um, charges, okay, because mm-hmm. they were dealing with a federal case where there was multiple, like we're talking about dozens of grow houses with marijuana at the yeah. time. And during that time, dude, um, it was like 2017, 2018. So in California, marijuana, um, they were allowing dispensaries to happen, but that was in the very beginning. Mm-hmm. So the reason why the fed, the, the feds, they were so tough on people doing grow houses is because, number one, they can't tax you. Yeah. And they tax the dispensaries. At that time, they were taxing them about like 30%. So if, if, if the government ain't getting the money, guess what? They're going to go after you. Dude. Oh, yeah. That's 100%. like, that's number one, right? So um, we were doing this operation. I remember they were just like, hey, here's your uniform. And I was just like, okay. And I remember the lieutenant, he was like such a cowboy, dude. Like, he, like every operation that we had, he would wear like boots. And um, he'd be like, Hey, this is uh this is Detective Espinoza, and this is his first day. Come, come, come over here and say a couple words. And at that time, I was, I was extroverted when I needed to be, bro. Like for my job, especially yeah. in law enforcement. But like I was still an introverted guy. Mm-hmm. I wasn't like to me, I wasn't leadership quality yet, where I could go ahead and command, you know, a hundred, you know, agents or or cops or whatever. Right. Yeah. I wasn't at that stage of the game yet. So I was just like, hey guys, you know, I'm Detective Espinoza. And then I remember the first day. There was a detective out of another agency in uh, Hayward PD, and he actually ended up becoming my mentor, a really good guy. I'm um, not going to disclose his name, but um, he goes and he goes, you're from Oakland, huh? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, all right, man. All right, we're going to see where you're, where you're about. <laughs> so they told me to drive what they call a Bearcat. A Bearcat is basically an armored vehicle that SWAT uses. So this task force, not only do they do undercover, but they also raid their own houses. They trained you with the FBI. They trained you with the DEA. So I got sent to all those trainings, which was badass, bro. Because not everybody in my agency got able to experience that. But anyways, on my first day, they're uh, briefing everybody up. And they're like, hey, um, we're going to go and like raid all these grows that are on all these houses and we're doing about 15 of them today and i was just like this is crazy bro like i went from being like a street cop to like doing surveillance on gang members and now i'm like raiding 15 houses on one operation like fully tacked out reminds me of like uh what's that fast and the furious with paul yeah, walker yeah, you know yeah. when like he like goes and raids like the bad guys yep. and then he goes back to like being undercover that's that was my life and uh <laughs> essentially i went and uh i remember we're driving to the first house, and this is where I'm going to stop it right after I tell you this. Well, we're going to the first house, and I remember everybody's in the back, ready to go, and they're like, all right, we're approaching the block. And I was just like, all right, so where do you want me to stop? In front of the house. And I remember the lieutenant goes, no, I want you to drive the, the Bearcat into the living room. And I'll never forget that, dude. I was like, <laughs> no one's ever going to believe me no. that I'm, on my first day on a narcotics task force, undercover i'm doing my first raid ever i'm 27 years old and it's almost like street kings it's almost like training day yeah. and they're like all right go push the gas dude i go over the curb and legit think of a swap tank bro it's halfway into this people's <laughs> living room and you see two guys running like ah, like bro and yeah. they're throwing flashbangs they're like cuffing people you see like an ak just casually like on the wall yeah. it was Chaos. It's like a movie scene. Dude, yes. <laughs> That's what I lived for like two and a half years when I started on that task force. And I have hundreds and hundreds of stories that I can Dude, I can recall. I should write a second book on this, but that's probably in the future. You should do like a podcast where you just share these crazy stories. Possibly, dude. I think that'll be great. People you know, love it. true crime is like the number one podcast. Really, like, John, dude. People go crazy for crime podcasts, like crazy. I might, I might I, have I would to. I say it's a decent idea. I might, uh, <laughs> yeah, I might have to take a, uh, take you I mean, up on that idea, stories bro. Like that, you're first day you're ripping uh, a literal tank through someone's living room is. Yeah, yeah, it was almost not believable. Like people, almost people are like, "Dude, really?" No, it, yeah, it's crazy, dude. <laughs> and I have all the pictures. Like I have so much social proof. It's insane. And uh, anybody that's worked with me, dude, they'll tell me that. Like I would casually just when they ask me questions like this, this is how I am. I'm a very calm person, dude. And uh, when it comes to business, I'll handle business. But yeah. like when you ask me this, I'm not gonna be like, oh yeah, I did this, I did that. I'm, I've never been like that, dude. I'm always been like, hey, I uh, w- w- what's the saying? Like uh, you gotta walk the talk. Yeah, you gotta. 
walk but, the talk before you talk the talk. I yeah, think is the right something way. like yeah. that, right? And uh, that I'm a big believer in that, man. So, you know, I came in there very humbled. And that was like the initial stages before I got into entrepreneurship mm -hmm. where I learned about mentorship. Mentorship, dude, is what guided me and made me like an award-winning detective, a, won a, bu a bunch of accommodations. It made me like allowed me to actually move up the ranks quite, quite a bit, mm -hmm. especially as a young detective because of all the people that poured into me, dude. And that's why I always tell people when they go into entrepreneurship, don't be super prideful. Don't have a chip on your shoulder. Because yeah. I remember in my 20s, dude, I was, you know, you're young and, you know, you you want to go ahead and you want to eat the world alive. It's something my parents will always yeah. tell me. But at the end of the day, you have to learn from somebody who actually has that level of success that you want. And that's what I learned in in, in law enforcement, dude, is just like I stayed humble and I went ahead and I learned from the best. So then I was able to just go up the ranks and have amazing cases and have amazing seizures, just like, you know, what I told you guys. But yeah, dude, the last two years in entrepreneurship, I was able to transition to simple businesses where uh, essentially first I started with uh, ATMs, automated teller machines, which is it didn't make me a multimillionaire, but it allowed me to become financially free. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people that watch your podcast, specifically young entrepreneurs, just like mm -hmm. yourself, um, I think it's very important to focus on first financial freedom over becoming a millionaire. Because you can still become a millionaire, but you're actively working towards holding that status. When you focus on becoming financially free, financially free means that you are trying to go ahead and work less, or work the same amount, and now you're going ahead and you're making more money. So that's something that I didn't learn when I was growing up, dude. Like, I came from an immigrant family. My mom came from Peru. My dad came from Mexico. They showed me how to work hard, but they didn't show me financial literacy. And I think, like, especially nowadays, high schools, colleges, they still don't show you that. No, they, they do sh not. Dude, they show you, like, the stuff that you need. And I, and I think, I mean, this is my perspective. This is my opinion, guys. So I'm not trying to disrespect anybody that's watching yeah. this. But essentially, like, I don't think anyone needs to go to college unless they're going into a profession that's, like, either medical or you're an engineer. And, you know, you have a li lot of liability. Yeah. Lawyer. Um, those will be good professions if you really have your heart into that. But other than that, if you guys are trying to, you don't know what you want to do, just like myself. I didn't know what to do, dude. I was corporate America for six years, um, law enforcement, and then now full-time entrepreneur for the past four years. Um, I lived three different careers, three different lives. And what I could say is just like, you're gonna learn from experience. The fastest route now is, dude, the digital space. Yep. It's like actually connecting with people just like us that have the experience. You're able to go ahead and pay directly to the person who knows the information. And majority of the time, entrepreneurs in the online space if they do have that type of connection where you're allowed to go ahead and reach out to them they will go ahead and say yeah i'll teach you everything but here's the price here's the price. nothing in life is free no, you gotta pay to play you gotta pay to play dude and, and that's one thing that i've always been i guess you could say good at is i don't mind paying for access yep. because that's just what it is man i've i paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to you know get mentored by people like russell brunson andy elliott but you know just a single thing that they've taught me could dramatically change my companies, dramatically changes the way I think, dramatically changes the way that I move. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about, man. As you get older, you want to develop and mature. It's about maturing and leveling up at every aspect of your life. Because even if you work hard in business and you become a multimillionaire or a billionaire, or whatever it is, right? What whatever it's gonna, you know, allow you to become fulfilled in life. You should never stop working in all aspects of your life. Health, your love life, which ultimately marriage, right? Yep. And then your finances. So when somebody says, like, how, how much do you work? And I, I tell them, well, I'm actually working 24-7. Hmm. Because even though I'm not working in the office, I'm still working when I go home. I'm working in the relationship between me and my wife. I'm working when I'm going to the gym. So whenever I get asked that question, it's just like I'm nonstop because I have goals, dude. Like, I have milestones that I reach every single year, dude. And that's one thing that I really focus on myself. And this is this is actually like a, you could say like a shortcut or like actually a strategy for everybody watching this is that like, if you feel bad of where you're at right now, okay, don't feel bad. Actually, look at all the small wins that you've been able to accomplish this year. As long as you're growing either mentally, physically, financially, you're on the right path. 
and you shouldn't compare yourself to anyone else. I think that's the problem with social media nowadays, dude, yep. is that everybody tries to compete, you know? And it's just like, how can you do that if you don't know the person and what they're doing behind the scenes, their background? You might think that this person that's saying they're self-made online at the age of 21 is really self-made, but realistically, they came from a good you know, upbringing. Yeah. They might have been set with a silver spoon in their mouth from their parents, and they're telling you, you know, for clout, that they've done all this and all that. When for a lot of the entrepreneurs that I've met, they've actually not grown up in a good upbringing. They typically come from poverty. They typically have had a dramatic situation or environment that forced them to evolve. Yep. And that was with me, dude. Like in law enforcement, even though it fulfilled me, even though like I got so used to like the control chaos, bro, like it really forced me to level up to not work such a dangerous job, but not just for me, but for my family, mm -hmm. because my mom would worry every day, of course. you know, like my family would worry every day. Um, my spouse who I was with during that time would worry every day. And I seen what it could do to humans when you're in a toxic environment long enough, you lose yourself, dude. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. It's about who you are inside and what fulfills you. Because once you get to the point of you make enough money, whatever your milestone is, dude, um, you're going to see whether that truly does fulfill you or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, you're going to, well, not you specifically, but anyone who, who gets to that level of success and wealth is going to really have a hard time determining what's going to make them happy. And I've gotten to that point, dude, in my life where, you know, I've made the money, I bought the cars. And can I say that, that all that makes me happy? It makes me happy for that time being, mm -hmm. but it gets old. Yep. It gets old, dude. So what makes me happy? Serving the people around me, serving my audience, helping other people become financially free uh, with small businesses, you know, the same path that I took, dude, because I'm a regular dude. I'm a blue collar guy, nine to fiver. And I'm not smarter than anyone else, dude. I think anyone can achieve what they want if they truly focus. That's, that's the key takeaway here, focus. 100%. And I mean, there's so much stuff I want to dive into from all of that. And one thing I want to highlight is what you mentioned about people not actually being who they are on social media. Yeah. Unfortunately, that is very true. Yeah. And in this world of podcasting, you meet a lot of these people that you followed for years and you thought were big and then you meet them and it's like, ah, it's not really what you've been selling for three years. Yeah. So for anybody that's comparing themselves to people online, stop. It's like a never ending game. It's not going to get you anywhere. But one thing I do want to double tap on your journey specifically, because I advocate for this a lot and it's not always the most popular opinion. I don't think that people should quit their nine to five to oh. go build a business. I think they should use their nine to five to create a business and then leave when it's time. You've mentioned a bunch of times you were doing the nine to five while creating the ATM business. What advice do you give to young entrepreneurs that are in a good sales job now, but want to go and run their own business or are working a corporate nine to five, but want to grow their own business? What's your advice to them? Dude, this is such a great question because this is the exact conversation I had with my wife from the airport when we landed in Miami yesterday from Vegas. And one thing that I was telling her is just like, there's a lot of people out there that want to be entrepreneurs mm -hmm. but i feel like there's not any leaders truly telling them the real like i guess sauce behind being an entrepreneur yep. and this is as real as it's gonna get dude this is we're gonna make clips we're gonna have this shit go viral but the real truth behind entrepreneurship it is not meant for 98 percent of the of the actual public out there and i'm not saying that you're not better than, than the 2%. I'm not saying that you can't do it. It is about choice and fulfillment. The reason why I tell you this, entrepreneurship for me has been one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, dude. And this comes from a guy that has worked so much in law enforcement that has been shot at, that has been in basically mini Iraq in Oakland, California, has dealt with politics, has has just dealt with the worst of the worst, guys. And I've also been in corporate America, so I talk from experience, okay? And I come from a, a, a family that, that lived in poverty, okay? So I was able to go ahead and escape my nine to five because I was forced to do it. And what do I mean by forced to do it? It came to a point where 
you know, my mother, she raised me as a single mother and I vowed to myself as a man that I was going to retire her because she gave up so much for me, man. And, and, and it was realistically the pain that I had throughout the years. Even when I was in law enforcement, I was like, damn, you know, yeah, I'm making $250,000, but I live in the Bay area. Mm -hmm. Essentially, Miami's becoming the Bay Area yeah. where it's just like, that's the level of expense, dude. You make $100,000, you're still like lightweight in poverty. Yeah. You know, you can't afford shit. And it, and it sort of sucks. So just imagine when, you know, you made a vow to yourself to like, go ahead and retire your mom. So th th that was sort of like the pain that I was using to fuel myself to go ahead and get into entrepreneurship. But once I got into entrepreneurship, once I got the success, once I, once I, you know, I bought the mansions, the cars, I was able to take care of my entire family, guys, change everything, be a bloodline breaker, dude, which... It feels great, yeah. but the amount of stress that I go through on a daily basis, I don't wish upon anyone else because it will break 98% of, of people trying to accomplish what I accomplished, dude. And it sucks because it sucks to say that because, you know, in social media, a lot of entrepreneurs, they paint the picture that, oh, yeah, it's going to do this. It's going to fulfill you. Oh, yeah, you're going to be able to help people. You're sacrificing yourself for fulfillment. You're sacrificing yourself for that level of wealth, that level of fulfillment, because when it comes down to it, it's hard. Yep. You're managing other people's emotions. Imagine hmm. having a hundred employees and then all of them rely on you emotionally, dude. That's what it is. Great leaders sacrifice themselves for their people. I sacrifice myself for every single employee, dude. I look out for them, make sure that they get paid because I know they got family. I get paid last. Yep. I get paid last. Every time. Dude, it is the best thing to get a number two position or a number three position, basically COO or maybe a CMO or even a CFO in any company. Why? Because you're not dealing with the major headaches when it comes to being a founder or a CEO. And that's what it is. So what I would recommend for anybody that wants to be an entrepreneur do this and promise, promise me you're going to do this. Become financially free with a side hustle or a business that you can still accomplish while you're working a nine to five, because then you will still be able to decide. It's not going to be too late. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be too late. See, I have so much on my plate right now. I can't go back to the nine to five. No, I, I can't. I just mentally, I can't. I can't because I have too many people relying on me. I have hundreds of employees that rely on me, dude. If I quit, guess what? They're all out of a job. Yep. My, my parents, they rely on me because I retired them. So now I put so much pressure inside of me, a pressure on me that I have to perform. But that's okay. I thrive under that. But once again, I'm me. This may not be for most people. Entrepreneurship is not, not for, most. for most people, dude. It's okay if you want to go into sales. Sales, dude, I recommend sales all day. Yep, 100%. All my sales guys, they get paid like $30,000, $50,000 a month, dude. Yeah. And they're all around your age, dude. They do well, and they, they don't do, have the stress. They do well, and they don't have the stress. <laughs> I'll give you a great example. Right now, I have one of my top tier sales guys. He just launched his program. I helped him out. And I remember uh, he would hit me up, dude, like every couple of days this past week. And he goes, dude, I didn't know you were dealing with this amount of stress. <laughs> I was like, you're dealing with the liability of customer service. You're dealing with fulfillment. You're dealing with complaints. You're dealing with marketing. You're dealing with, you know, a hiring, which is extremely tough. You're dealing with managing employees. You're dealing with the expenses, the overhead, which is super, super, uh, like stressful, stressful dude. <laughs> so instead of going ahead and focusing on just sales and then once you're done, you make your money. That's it. Yep. Right. And, if I was to do it all over again, that's what I would do. I would go ahead, become financially free with a side hustle, and then focus on sales, dude. You're doing tech sales. You yep. and your wife do tech sales. That's great, dude. I recommend that most young people actually get into sales because without sales, guys, that's one of the top three pillars that you need to run a successful business. Client acquisition, sales, and then fulfillment. Those, that's it. That's all you need to go ahead and actually run a successful business. If you don't focus on those three pillars, you don't have a business. A lot of people, they just don't know how to communicate nowadays, soft skills. Yep. And if you're able to dominate soft skills, you make a little bit of money in sales, then guess what? 
then you can make the educated decision to see if you want to be a CEO or a founder because you've been in companies, you've been mentored by CEOs and founders. And then you're able to go ahead and decide if that's truly what you want, man, purpose. 100%. And that's what it's about, dude, purpose. So once again, guys, become financially free while you're at your nine to five. Every single one of you guys are able to do it, but you have to make hard decisions on what you're gonna do, whether you're gonna keep doing what you're doing in your old life to give up for your new life. I talk to this uh, to my mentees all the time. I always have mentees that go, well, you know, my job is forcing me to come into the office now, man. And I was just like, okay, so let me ask you, what do you do on the weekends? Well, I sleep in a little bit, I go to the gym, I go grocery shopping, so let me ask you this. You, this is what you want in life, right? You have to sacrifice what you're currently doing in your life in order to build that new life that you want. And that, and that was the thing, dude, to go back to what I was saying earlier, I was still working in law enforcement. I was running a six figure a month business before I quit. And I still had a tangible business with my ATMs. So technically I was running three things. The only thing, the reason why I was able to do that, delegation, but you also learn from experience. Yep, you don't put yourself out there. Don't just leave your job without being fi financially secure, dude. That's the number one thing, dude. It's just like you have to have that that cushion because otherwise you're going to be in a much stress. I've had friends that had just went all in in entrepreneurship and now they're like in the verge of being homeless, and it sucks. That's where the real pressure comes into. Hundred percent. Yeah, man. Great question. No, it's it's because it's <laughs> something that I highlight. Like one, I always push people to sales because I think those are like very tangible, like things you can do, and very that skill can be translated almost anywhere. You can yeah. take it anywhere. You could use it. You could fall back on it. So I think that's like one of the best starting points. And I love that you highlighted the like, oh, but I got to go to the office and what, dude? You got to work on the weekends. Yeah. For all my guys listening now and, and the girls that like football too, it is week one of the NFL season. It's one <laughs> o'clock right now. All the games are kicking off. We're sitting here <laughs> ripping a podcast. And if you don't think I've got eight fantasy leagues going, I, I don't care about that. It's about putting priorities first. Anything leisure related will come and you'll be able to enjoy it. And the way that I think about it is as long as I work my ass off now between 25 and 30, if I do everything right and I play my cards right, I'll, I'll have the time to enjoy whatever I want in the latter half of my life. But the grind comes first because you can't expect results without putting in any of the work. Yeah. It's just not possible. Um, and I, I know we're coming a little bit to time here. We've talked so deeply about what it's like to run a business, what it's like to create a business. I want to make sure we do highlight your journey from the companies you built, the ATMs, ATM Together, now with the merchant business, I want to make sure we do talk about that. Of course, man. Yeah. So uh, essentially, I started off with ATMs and then um, became financially free. I had about 30 locations while I was still in law enforcement. Uh, I was bringing in roughly around twelve to 15000 a month. Um, my bills in general in the Bay Area at that time, dude, I had a million dollar home. Um, I was driving my dream car, a Porsche Panamera at the time. Black rims. Black rims. Um, it was awesome. And uh, everybody at the police department was just like, he's a drug dealer for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, all right, whatever. whatever, whatever. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I was able to cover my uh, overhead expenses of living for 6300 $6, bucks, which is cool. So it would still leave me cash flow. Um, a lot of people were like, well, why didn't you just quit there and then? Well, the thing is, like, it reduced, it actually helped me reduce the 80 to 100 hours to 40 hours working in the department. So now I had all this time, dude. Yep. And with me, I'm... Uh, I guess you could say um, I have ADD or ADHD, whatever you want to call it. But like, I was just like, dude, I got to do something. Yep. So um, I jumped back on Facebook after not being on social media for eight years. Started reading uh, Russell Brunson's books, which he's right now my mentor. Um, and uh, Dan Henry, another a digital mm -hmm. marketer, uh, digital millionaire, completely changed my life. Um, I know it sounds cliche. Because we always hear that from yeah. entrepreneurs, this book changed my life. Yeah. And then you read it and you're like, how? Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, taking in perfect action. That's what it comes down to. Yep. It's not just going ahead and uh, reading and reading and reading and absorbing all this information and then getting stuck on what I like to say analysis paralysis. Yep. Because a lot of people do, even though I did for like more than a decade. But it's really just taking in perfect action, just saying, fuck it, man. I'm going to do fuck this. It. Fuck it. Right? And um, went ahead. Invested $10,000 into a course that I didn't know nothing about digital marketing, dude. 
So uh, I still remember one of my coworkers at a special victims unit was just like, he walked around and he was like, hey, what are you looking at? And I was just like, dude, I bought this course for like $10,000. It's going to show me how to basically um, set up a program online where I could teach people how to start their own ATM businesses. Uh, because right now everybody hates the police and no one's going to want to learn how to be a cop. So I figured, <laughs> you know, path of least resistance, ATMs, right? And he was just like, that's the stupidest idea ever. You got fucking scammed for your $10,000. Good luck. That's when you know it's good. So you know it's good. At that time, dude, I swear to God, him telling me that, I felt like shit. Yeah. I felt like course. shit. Now, when somebody tells me, oh, it's a scam, it's a scam. It's good. Yeah, it's, it's, good. A, it's like, go fuck yourself. Yeah, this right? is a good one. Yeah. <laughs> so um, essentially, uh, it took six months. I call it six months of health, hell. And um, I went from making my first $1,000 in October. Uh, it was probably like October, September but of 2020. I had initially started investing in uh, April of 2020 into digital marketing, learned the course and all that stuff, dude. And dude, when I tell you this, my website was ugly. My my resources were ugly. Um, absolutely everything I put out was just like, it looked like a five-year-old made it, dude. So I was able to go ahead and... Um... Oh, we good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was able to go ahead and uh, just make it work. Just provide value, value, value. Um, and then from there, it started growing little by little. Uh, first program that came out was called 30 Day ATM Biz. And sold that for like 997 dude, 1000 bucks. Uh, showed people how to start their ATM business within 30 days. And then um, it just started growing month after month, dude. And essentially, it's as, I'm going to say it very simple. Like, you're, you guys watching right now, you're going to think this is super simple, but it's not. Um, essentially, I would do hundreds of posts uh, every week uh, marketing my ATM program and then my experience, so I'm social proof from my own business. And then what I would do is I would just reach out to people in the DMs on Instagram, on Facebook, and I would just do weekly lives for free. And um, at the very end, I would go ahead and basically ask people to jump on a call with me, 15 minutes. And then on these calls, we would just have that deep conversation of how intrigued they were with the ATM business. And what I found out, especially in my early stages of being a digital marketer, is your personal brand is everything, bro. Like, it doesn't matter what type of company you have. If you could put a face to it, even Russell Brunson says this, you will 10x your profits. And because people really buy into your story. People yeah. really buy into you, dude. Um, and what I found out, especially because I had a lot of naysayers in the very beginning, say like, hey, dude, like what makes your ATM program better than others? Because there was already like a handful of them out there. I was just like, well, I mean, it's my story. It's this is what I'm able to show you. This is my like my strategy. And some people in the very beginning, they were just like, they were hating on it. And other people were like, we're down. We love this. So um, it started growing. And then by March of 2021, um, my first ever uh, six figure a month um, in profits, uh, still working at the police department. It was like a dream, dude. I made $120,000 off of uh, my first company, ATM Together. I was a one man team. I was doing the marketing, I was doing the sales, I was doing absolutely everything. My routine during that time, so you guys know what it takes to actually build a business while you're still at your nine to five. I was working at, I was waking up at like four or 5 a.m. every single day, because I was still living in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my clients, they were still here in Miami, yep, New York and all that, so East Coast. So three hours ahead. So when it was 8 a.m. over here, it was 5 a.m. out there, and dude, they would see like, me with my eyes, bloodshot red, they're like, dude, are you just waking up? I was like, yeah, I'm in Cali. They're like, oh, that oh. makes that super early. <laughs> so I would go ahead and take calls from like 5 a.m. all the way up to about 10 a.m. So five hours of just calls back and back and back, back. Like each call was like about 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And then after that, I would set up my marketing. And then I would hit the gym for about an hour, get a nap uh, and an hour in between, and then start my shift, dude. I would start my shift roughly around like, 1 p.m. and then I wouldn't leave the office at the department uh, till like 1 a.m. So it was like 12 hour shifts. Um, and then come home, I was literally having like three to five hours of sleep for six months. And a lot of people say that, well, that's unhealthy. Well, here's the thing. It's like when you don't smoke, when you do not rely on alcohol, um, when you don't do the unhealthy shit that essentially kills you faster yeah. and you are focusing and you have a good deep sleep, and you take care of yourself by going to the gym and you know eating healthy. It's a night and day shift, dude. You know, so I was able to sustain it for those six months. Do I recommend that someone does it for like a year, two years? F fuck no. 
you know, it's not the way to do it, but you have to go ahead and do some level of sacrifice in order to make it happen. And I was able to do that. I was hyper focused, man. And um, once I was able to achieve that $120,000 a month, I remember I was going to a good friend of mine who actually is one of my uh, COOs now for mm -hmm. one of the businesses. And he was a sergeant of police. He was a brand new sergeant of police, youngest guy in the department. And I go to him. I was like, hey, dude, so I just made $120,000 off this program off of, you know, me building ATM businesses. What do you think I should do? And um, he goes, dude, fucking quit. Put in your two weeks and fucking go. What the fuck's wrong with you? And I was just like, well, you know, earlier that day, I had a conversation with my mom. And my mom, once again, hard worker. Uh, she was a plebotomist at UC San Francisco. And she comes from Peru. So she knows how to work hard. You know, she had her American dream. And essentially, she had told me, she's like, well, benefits. That's the first thing parents always say, yeah. benefits, right? So we were able to go ahead and... Um, she was she was able to convince me, dude, and because I love my mother so much, uh, she told me to save a hundred no to save a million dollars or to make a million dollars first from that side hustle before I leave, and I was just like okay like and that was gonna be my plan, dude, make a million dollars before I leave, uh, you know the police department from that specific uh, side hustle of digital marketing, and uh, if it wasn't for that one friend to tell me to dude fucking leave, I probably would have worked at the police department for like the remainder of 2021. Um, and then I, I truly believe I still would have made 2 million that first year, but making that move, leaving when I was financially secure already, it didn't give me a lot of stress. I was able to hyper-focus. And that's one thing you guys got to realize is like, you want to be able to be in an environment where you're able to hyper-focus. If you're around toxic people, if you're worried about anything else, in your life besides the business and what you have to do for that business, it's going to be 10 times harder mm -hmm. and you're going to suffer and you're not going to be motivated. So my suggestion is become financially free, fi figure out a way to become financially free first, meaning that you're able to just cover your bills. It doesn't mean being a millionaire, yeah. just cover your bills. That's it. So you don't have to worry about that. So you can focus on building the business. Now, when you go all in on the business, um, dude, I relocated I went to San Diego. Why did I do that? Because I still had a whole lot of friends that were still in that old way of thinking, that old environment, man. Mm -hmm. Environment's everything. Yep. So when you keep yourself around the same circle of people, when you're leveling up, that's going to keep you. What I like to be, uh, what I like to say is, it's called the force of average. Mm -hmm. And the force of average is going to try to force you to stay average. Because guess what? You're leveling up. The rest of your circle is still average. So what's going to happen when you're trying to talk to them about building a million-dollar idea when they only make about, what, $100,000 a year? They're going to shit on you. They're going to shit on you, dude, <laughs> because people want you to do good but not better than them. Yep. And they that's want just, you to be right where they are. Yeah, exactly. And that's just the way it is, man. And there's nothing wrong with that. At the end of the day, that's how the majority of people are. But you want to go ahead and align yourself with like-minded individuals that just are trying to level up no matter what stage you're at. Yeah. So that's what I've really learned. And that's what developed me to go ahead, move to San Diego, get a penthouse for two years, dude, and just grow two companies now that are massively growing. Um, I was able to delegate CEOs. I got into credit card processing, which now it's the new wave because it's a big blue ocean mm -hmm. in the United States and in Canada. It's saving 100% of credit card fees for merchants, small uh, mom and pop shops, and also e-commerce. If uh, if you guys are in the digital marketing game, you know Stripe right now is literally show. shitting on everybody. Yeah. Right now they're holding about $300,000 of my money. Dude, I Dude it's, crazy. The, it's crazy. I've heard so many horror stories. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's bad. So I, essentially, um, now we got into that game because we we see where it's going. A lot of the big time digital marketers and consultants that I look up to, um, they're investing into those type of businesses, mm -hmm. processing. Because you got to think about it. Since COVID, dude, it went up by 80%. Oh, yeah. You know, it just skyrocketed because everybody's now ordering from home. Um, they're using all these applications, and it's just going to grow and grow and grow. It's already passed a $2 trillion industry. It's going to pass by a $3, uh, three, a $3 trillion industry by uh, 2025. So at the end of the day, if you're looking to go ahead and build residuals for yourself, um, I highly recommend going into merchant services, but not just going into merchant services in general. There's a specific strategy called the cash 
discount program. And the way that works, this is a strategy that the actual banks and a lot of processing companies are keeping away from the general public mm. and customers. The reason why, because if they tell their customers that they can save 100% of their fees, guess what, dude? They're going to lose billions of dollars because yeah. it's going to be a ripple effect. People are going to be pissed. They're like, why didn't you tell us this from the beginning? And this has been uh, available for the past four years. So now less than 5% of merchants use this. And because less than 5% of merchants use this, the average person like myself or like you are able to start this side hustle where you're able to sign up with an ISO, an independent sales organization that has the actual network. I partnered up with the co-founders of my company, Merchant Automation, which they provide the, the network. So now that I'm a co-founder, I own the network and I'm able to provide the network to you. So what we do is we team up with entrepreneurs that want to get into this business and they either want to learn how to sell it, okay, because we, we teach a sales training, we set you up with all the components like the terminals at wholesale pricing, um, absolutely everything, even locations, which wow. is amazing, right? Yeah. That's the hardest portion of it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of introverted people. I understand that. I was introverted once. So at the end of the day, we're able to do like 90% of the work for you. We also have another concept where we do absolutely everything. If you're like a passive investor, right, mm -hmm. and uh, you want to invest into money into making residuals instead of having it sit in your bank, well, dude, the calculations and like the research that we have done, we've done extensive research where like if you were to go ahead and put your money, let's say if you were to put anywhere between ten to thirty thousand dollars in a bank account, it would take you twenty years to make the same amount of money that you would with credit card terminals, which is amazing because you're able to make 100% of your ROI within the first year. Now, how is that possible? You're probably thinking like, dude, that's amazing. Why isn't everybody doing it? Well, it's not exposed yet. We were only a year in. Yeah. A year in, 700 clients, still growing, about 100 clients a month now. Wow. Uh, the company has grown to 70 employees, um, and we're just looking to do live events starting next month, starting in Atlanta, Miami, and then uh, California. And it's going to grow massively, dude. Like my vision for this company, it's a $100 million a year company. Um, it's it's dramatically, dramatically going to change the lives of millions of people. It's just more people got to know about it. And that's all it is. So yep. so what are we doing? What's our strategy, bro? Digital marketing. Digital marketing. Digital marketing, dude. That's it. Digital marketing is essentially the shortcut to go ahead and get more eyeballs to your business. If you have a great offer, it's proven. You know it works. You know it could get people results then essentially that's the path you need to take. That, that, that is what I call the path of least resistance, dude. In law enforcement, that's what we would always talk about. Okay, well, we see this guy. It's an active situation. He has hostages. What is the path of least resistance we could go to make sure everybody's safe? Yep. Same thing in business. I take that same verbiage and I go and say, hey, dude, you know, the path of least resistance. We could work hard, but I'd rather work smart. Always work smarter than harder. No, absolutely, man. Thank you so much for sharing, like, one, not only what you're building, and if anybody's listening and is attracted to the ATM business, the merchant, all of that will be linked below for you to go check that out because I think it's really interesting. But I also appreciate you sharing what it took from your perspective to actually make it happen Yeah. because we – as much as I want to empower people listening to go into entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. I also want to weed out the people that shouldn't make the mistake. And if you're listening now and you heard your journey and that was not attractive to you, <laughs> right now is your time to potentially go and get a sales job or go and make great money. You can still be successful, still be rich, still buy the good house, the car, but it doesn't need to be as the CEO. If everything that was stated there was unattractive, didn't seem like something you want to do, it's probably your time to go that route. But for anybody that saw that and is a little more excited, has a little bit more fire behind them, this is your time to go and just repeat that blueprint, work your ass off, find something you're passionate about and turn it into a business, but do it smart. Don't just go all in, have a nine to five, fill your bank account, run up the offer, run up whatever you want. So I, I do really appreciate you diving in because most people tell you what they do, but don't tell you how they did it. Yeah. And I think a lot of people need to hear actually what needs to go in. Yep. And I think that a lot of people are gonna get a ton of value. As we come to the end here, I wanna just allow you to give all of the entrepreneurs listening to us a one minute spiel on what would be your number one advice to the young people trying to get into the game right now. Yeah, no, absolutely. No matter what niche or industry you're trying to get into, uh, I would always advise people to just 
Number one, go ahead and get mentorship right away from somebody that you look up to, like somebody that you want their lifestyle. You know, I know there's a ton of people over there like, I want to be like Andrew T. Yeah. Dude, go check out his Hustler University. There's nothing wrong with that. Yep. Self-education, you can never go wrong with that. I'd rather spend 250K on self-education over going ahead and going to college. That 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 is my my opinion guys okay um take it for what it is but listen to your parents you know they obviously they love you for a reason but um th th that's my point of take it's just like you have to invest in order to go ahead and make money yep. either way it goes you're gonna invest with either liquid or you're gonna invest with your time now if you don't have a lot of time because you're working a nine to five then Work a little harder, save up, because I always get this question a lot from young entrepreneurs. Dude, how can I make money in order to go ahead and invest into like one of your programs? Or how can I go and invest and start investing in myself? Dude, find a second job. You know, I had a buddy yesterday who is one of the buddies, unfortunately, that, you know, he got into entrepreneurship. And uh, dude, he's, it's going bad. Mm -hmm. It's going bad, but it's just because he didn't have a plan and also he didn't listen to me. Mm -hmm. And I told him, dude, like, no, like, please, like, just do both. He's yeah. like, no, I'm going all in. Well, now he's on the verge. He's like, bro, and like, I need a loan and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I'm going to give it to you, bro. But, you know, like at the end of the day, what's going to happen next month? Yeah. Right? So what's going to change? What's going to change? And I told him, like, you got to think outside the box. Are you doing Uber Eats? Are you going ahead and driving Uber? Like, oh, I didn't think about that. Bro, like you're saying you want to be an entrepreneur, but entrepreneurs are solution driven. Mm -hmm. There's no excuses when it comes in having your own safety net. That's that's the meaning of entrepreneurship. You're taking a higher risk than majority of the people. And this is why I say not everybody's built to be an entrepreneur. And it's not to be a negative Nancy, guys. No, it's, but just, it's honest. just it's just I'm being honest. Like <laughs> it, it's really not. Even Alex Ramosi, dude, he's well known. He even has a couple episodes and clips that says the exact same thing. Entrepreneurship sucks. <laughs> it does because it's 90 percent of boring work that you don't want to do whether it's sitting behind a desk, whether it's communicating with people, it, it, dude, it's, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. My bandwidth at the afternoons, it's like gone, like yeah. I'm a zombie. It's crazy. But with that being said, let me, let, let me leave you guys with some words of encouragement. Look, whatever you believe, you can achieve. I'm a true believer in that. You have to stay motivated. You have to stay optimistic. But the first thing that you have to fix in every, every single entrepreneur is your mindset. Because if you truly believe you can do it, all you need to do is just mix a little bit of imperfect action with it, dude, and you can fucking do it. Yep. No 100%. one can stop you. It's you versus you. You're just getting in your head and you're creating the roadblocks that are not there. So just fucking do it and get it done. And that's it. Dude, I love it. Thank you so much for course, coming on bro. the show, providing so much free value for all the listeners. And even for myself, like I do this show because I get to sit here and listen and learn from you. And now I get to go back and implement it into my businesses and everything I'm doing. And this has been a just a full episode of free game. And that's the goal from this show. So I appreciate you making it happen. I appreciate you coming on the show. And I, I, I can't wait to continue to watch your success, continue to watch you blow up these businesses and have you on every year to continue to highlight what you're building and what you've done. Absolutely, man. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Woo. All right. All right. Dude, thank you, man. Of course. How was that? Good? Solid, dude. Yeah, Solid awesome. questions. I love it. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. I try and go unscripted and kind of just... So do you want to say like an ending or anything? Or No, no. That's, that's it. Just, yeah, okay, that's okay, cool. It. We're done. Okay. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're good. We're good. Yeah. yeah. yeah we're